Hello, everyone. We're going to get started shortly. We're just giving people some time to join. Good afternoon, everyone. All right, well, hello again, um, and welcome to our webinar, Ask the Expert Recurrent Ovarian Cancer. I'm Maggie Nicholas Alexander, the Senior Director of Gynecologic Cancer Patient Support and Education at SHARE. Before the presentation begins, I'd like to tell you a little bit about SHARE. We're a national nonprofit that supports, educates, and empowers anyone who has been diagnosed with breast or gynecologic cancers and provides outreach to the general public about signs and symptoms because no one should have to face breast, ovarian, uterine, cervical, or metastatic breast cancer alone. For more information about upcoming webinars, support groups, and our helplines, please visit our website at sharecancersupport.org. Now we have a few housekeeping reminders for you. All participants will be muted during the webinar. This webinar will be entirely Q&A based using questions submitted through the registration form and those submitted live during the program. Please submit any questions through the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen. Remember that the speaker is unable to give specific medical advice, so please keep your questions general in nature. We also have closed captioning available. You can enable this feature by clicking on the live transcript button at the bottom of the screen and selecting the subtitle option. This webinar is being recorded and we'll share the recording in a few weeks with all registrants, and it will also be added to our website. And now I'd like to highlight the, a special piece about this program. This is SHARE's ninth annual Joan Summer Educational Program. Joan was a nurse diagnosed with stage four ovarian cancer at the birth of her third child. She lived with ovarian cancer for 22 years. With her natural wry humor and intelligence, Joan and her family inspired and supported the SHARE community. Through programs like this, the summer legacy continues. Now, I'd like to hand it over to today's speaker, Dr. Roisin O'Carroll, who we're so excited to have here today. Dr. O'Carroll, would you like to introduce yourself? Thanks so much, uh, Maggie. Um, I'm delighted to be here and honored to be asked. I'm Roisin O'Carroll. I'm a medical oncologist. I specialize in um, the management of ovarian cancer and other gynecologic cancers. I'm our research director at Memorial Sloan Kettering. And I also am, I'm also very involved in our cell therapy program. And I am the director for the patient and family centered care grant initiative there. We really try and improve the experience for not only our patients, but also their support network, including their family. So delighted to be here. Great, thank you so much. And so we're gonna get the Q&A discussion started. Uh, we will try to get through all of the submitted questions, but we may not be able to due to time constraints. And I'm just gonna say again, you know, remember that Dr. O'Carroll cannot give specific medical advice, so please try to keep your questions general. All right, so we're gonna dive in with some of the questions that were submitted through the registration form. Um, so let's start sort of more general. Um, and what are some of the symptoms of ovarian cancer recurrence? Um, so similar to the presentation itself of ovarian cancer, often the, the symptoms are quite nonspecific, same with the signs. So sometimes people might report that they have feeling much more bloated, they have what's called early satiety, and that means that they feel full, maybe just after eating a little bit. And sometimes they can feel a little bit nauseous, may in indeed even have some vomiting and shortness of breath. Sometimes there can be fluid on the lungs. 
um, swelling of the abdomen. And sometimes people can palpate a mass as well. Um, but in general, um, you know, I, I think often um, we will pick up because you'll be following closely with your doctor anyhow, following your initial diagnosis of ovarian cancer. So usually at those visits between taking talking to the doctor and telling them about your symptoms and their examination, we're usually able to pick up most of, of these recurrences. So um, I, I know sometimes my patients worry because when they presented, they didn't have any initial symptoms. And so they're worried they missed something and that's absolutely not their fault. It's just, it's one of these cancers that doesn't really tend to cause um, specific symptoms. It tends to be more a nonspecific thing. So I would just encourage anyone to talk to their physician and to let them know if you have new symptoms. The other thing not to forget is everybody gets GI upset and food poisoning and things like that. So it's usually more a persistence of these type of symptoms. A once off does not mean that the cancer is definitely recurred or, or anything like that. So I, I think always just call your doctor's office to get a bit of reassurance. Great, thank you. And um, I'm seeing we got a question live and it was also, there was one submitted in advance about um, Mervituzumab slash Elahir. Um, and so I'm wondering if you could talk about the effectiveness of MERV and then also about the side effects, including eye toxicity and um, lung issues. Sure, so Mervituximab is what's called an antibody drug conjugate. So that's a new type of treatment. It does actually have a bit of chemo in it, but the idea is it's kind of a smart way of delivering the chemo. And um, so in order to be eligible for that drug, your cancer has to express the target. In this case, it's called folate receptor. And for this particular folate receptor target, it has it's the approval is for those with very high expression. So at least 75% of the cells have to highly express uh, of the cancer cells that they look up in the microscope have to express the folate receptor. And there's different groups um, that can do that, but usually tissue is required and it gets sent away to a company or your your own hospital might be able to do that testing too. Um, we aren't requiring it to be like a new biopsy, so we can usually do it on, on tissue from before. In terms of the effectiveness, I, I think it's a really exciting treatment option. It's for patients who have had platinum resistant disease. That's the current approval. There are studies looking at it in the earlier setting of platinum sensitive. And the per the label, it's for patients who've received one to three prior lines of treatment. But I know all of us are um, offering it to anybody that we feel is appropriate who has that folate receptor on their cancer. There are clinical trials looking at other different um, folate receptor targeting ADCs. So for those who have maybe lower expression, that might be an option in the future. In terms of toxicity, a lot of these drugs tend to cause neuropathy. Um, so that's pins and needles in the fingers and the toes. And so that can be pretty significant and something definitely to tell the doctor about. Extremely rarely, I touch wood, I haven't had a patient have it yet. A patient can have pneumonitis, that's inflammation of the lungs. And that's just because of the particular chemo drug that's attached to the antibody drug conjugate. And that can be pretty serious. So we, you definitely would report if you're becoming short of breath. That usually they can pick it up on an x-ray or a CT scan. And the treatment for that is steroids, but it's kind of important not to delay um, diagnosing that either. Um, and eye toxicity. Mm -hmm. So a lot of these agents um, have special eye precautions in general. And again, touch wood, my experience is when we take these precautions, I, I really haven't had patients with significant eye toxicity. So what do I mean by that? Well, you have to take some uh, there's certain steroid drops that you have to take. You have to continue them on for, for almost two weeks. Um, you cannot wear contact lenses and you have to go see an eye doctor for Mervituximab before the first treatment, the third, the fifth, and the seventh. Um, and, and of course, report if you're having any eye symptoms. And the idea is trying to keep the, uh, the eyes by that. Because of the type of drug, it can irritate the lining of the outside of the eye. So that's the why you have to be so careful and not poke your eye or you know, put anything in it. So, um, and the eye doctors are, are normally very helpful, but it's super important. And I wouldn't treat a patient if they haven't um, seen an eye doctor, I would try and get the eye appointment very urgently for them to um, facilitate it. Because I don't want to miss um, and treat somebody when the eye doctor would have picked up that they actually had some early stages of maybe um, symptoms. So it's just important that, that those are addressed first. I think those are all the questions, were they? Yes, I think that covered it for that. Thank you. Um, and so I'm seeing another thing we're getting um, a lot of questions about are 
Uh, what are your thoughts on PARP after PARP for recurrent ovarian cancer? Um, and in what instances would that be appropriate? Mm -hmm. Ideally, I think it would be done in the setting of a clinical trial. I'm not super enthusiastic about PARP after PARP. Why that is, is because um, I do think that um, chemo or cancers tend to be less sensitive to it. However, I suppose if somebody was on a PARP a long time ago and they derived really good benefit, um, then it might make sense to re-challenge. But the, when they did the studies of PARP after PARP, although they did show some benefit, it really wasn't a long amount of time of benefit. Like it wasn't what I would get excited about. You know, I get excited about when I see that it delays the cancer by many, many months, then that's something I think is, is worthwhile. PARP inhibitors can cause toxicity. And one thing that we won't worry when somebody's had a lot of uh, PARP inhibitors is, is a risk of leukemia and, and a rare thing called myelodysplastic syndrome. So because the drugs um, can cause uh, symptoms that can be quite severe and because of it's not as effective, I would give a PARP again if I had a good clinical trial to offer. I might give it in combination with a new drug or something like that. But um, the other person, maybe somebody who has a BRCA mutation, I mean, that might. But honestly, in my practice, I don't tend to use a lot of PARP after PARP um, outside the setting of a, a clinical trial. Even even if they're platinum sensitive, yeah, I I would my yeah I wouldn't necessarily give it, but it, but you could. It it also mm -hmm. depends like why did they stop the par parp? Like if somebody had a lot of side effects and say they only got a week or two of it or a month or two, well then that to me is almost as if they never had a parp, and then mm -hmm. I might try and figure out a, an easier way to be able to um to to treat them, um. Yeah, that, they're my main reasons. If somebody had got a lot of par, PARP, I worry that if I continue on with a PARP, I'm going to cause a lot of, I'm going to increase that risk of um, possibly developing a leukemia or something like that in the future. So that, that's something I would worry about. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, and this person is asking if you could discuss treatments or and breakthroughs for um, non BRCA ovarian and clear cell ovarian cancer. Yeah, great questions. I mean, I think um, the Mervituximab is great for uh, both of those scenarios because, you know, they, they may or may not be BRCA. It's not necessarily associated with it. It's it's looking more if it has the um, folate receptor and a clear cell theoretically could be. So I would definitely check my patients with clear cell cancer to see if their cancer expresses the folate receptor. Um, I think for clear cell, we also think immunotherapy approaches are quite good. And I definitely think bevacizumab, another name for that drug is Avastin. I think that type of approach as well can be very good. Um, we have clinical trials as well, you know, trying to look at those particular um, diseases. Uh, some of them are targeting novel targets like ARID1A. So often these tr clinical trials open and close, they might be the first time that we're giving it to somebody. So often we're just treating a very small number of patients and, we're, and then we're trying to figure out if, if the drug is helpful or not or whether we should move it forward. Mm -hmm. Great, and while we're on the subject of clear cell, um, is there any role for radiotherapy for recurrent clear cell ovarian cancer? And also what about PARP inhibitors? That's a great question. So for clear cell, sometimes it depends where it recurs, whether or not I'd recommend radiation. Um, it is one of the cancers that sometimes I do recommend radiation for, but if it's just one spot, like definitely was a spot in the spine or in the brain, then I 100% would think that that was a very good treatment option. If there was a lot of cancer within the abdomen, I probably wouldn't want to radiate the entire abdomen. So I, I'd be less enthusiastic in that situation or maybe if there was a pelvic recurrence, just one isolated spot. Although if the surgeon could also take it out, I might prefer if they took it out. Sometimes if we do um, radiation, it can make surgery in the uh, later stages tricky. Um, mm -hmm. And also anytime you radiate things, there's a higher risk of the patient developing a bowel obstruction in the future. So just these are just things that we have to keep in mind. So it's absolutely not wrong to do radiation, but it really would be depend on the individual patient if it was indicated or not. Mm -hmm. And then for PARP inhibitors? Oh, again, a lot of these can, uh, sorry, a small number can be associated mm -hmm. with BRCA. I would definitely not say a lot. Mm -hmm. um, 
Um, so it definitely, if there's a, a BRCA mutation, I would encourage the use of a PARP. Mm -hmm. um, if there isn't, then I, I think we'd have most of the trials really didn't include patients without a BRCA. If they clear cell histology, they also required a BRCA mutation. Mm -hmm. So the data that we have really is extra is more coming from the more common types like the high grade serous mm -hmm. and the endometrioid. Um, and so it would be just a little bit harder to know how much benefit somebody who doesn't have a BRCA mutation and has clear cell histology would derive. But I think that's a case where you could definitely talk to your physician about it. Um, and then there's another test that we often do. It's called H or D. And the D bit is for deficient. Um, and so if it's positive, so it's H or D positive, um, then sometimes we think those patients might derive more benefit from PARP inhibitors as well. For clear cells specifically, I might be enthusiastic at combining a PARP inhibitor with um, a bevacizumab. That might, to me, be a good combination in that situation. Depends on the stage too. So that usually it's for patients with advanced stage or recurrent disease rather than early stage. Because for those, we, we wouldn't give a PARP and we probably wouldn't give bevacizumab either. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, and so this person is asking if you've had a recurrence while you were on bevacizumab for maintenance, does that mean it is no longer a treatment option for you? Can you say that? In, so if you had a recurrence while on bevacizumab? While you were on bevacizumab, um, does that mean it's no longer a treatment option for you? Um, the quick answer is it depends. Um, I do definitely give Bev after Bev. Um, sometimes I don't give it in the immediate next line of treatment. However, just pretend they weren't on the treatment that long and they had a lot of fluid and it all dried up. Then I might feel that maybe the chemo component wasn't working as well and I might switch out the chemo drug and continue the Bev. Um, so I think that would be a discussion with your physician about what they feel for you as an individual, the benefit of the Bev continuation might be and um absolutely similar to taxol you know we can give it in multiple lines of treatment and i would do the same but i do individualize it and like other any drug there are risks so with with bevacizumab the risks are like high blood pressure um strokes blood clots um holes in the bowel so it, it's a great drug and and i think it's an absolutely wonderful treatment option that said um you always have to think about who the individual patient is and what the risks and benefits are mm -hmm. That makes sense. Um, and so we're getting a question about what are the most promising latest treatment options for low-grade serous ovarian cancer? So for low-grade serous, there's um, currently a clinical trial for anyone newly diagnosed. So they haven't had any treatment yet um, and they've had their surgery and it's looking at chemotherapy, the standard, which is carbotaxol, followed by letrozole, um, or it's offering letrozole. And letrozole is a, an anti-hormone is what I would call it, but it's called an aromatase inhibitor. And the idea is that it blocks the, um, in people who've gone through the menopause or their ovaries are out, it, it blocks the conversion of t um, uh, like um, male kind of steroids that convert to estrogens. So it's this um, enzyme called aromatase. And so the idea there is that maybe we could do an anti-hormonal option for patients with low-grade serous. And the idea is maybe even if we could possibly forego chemo in some of those patients, but that's what that study is going to address. And um, there are also MEK inhibitors for low-grade serous. And then there are newer drugs as well that are called targeted um, drugs. One of them is called Avujima, which is a, a, a difficult to say name, but those are... Um, these targeted agents the targeting fact fast and different pathways that are important for low grade serous but i definitely think for low grade serous hormones and anti hormones is something that we often try and that tends to have very minimal um, side effects and what specifically in the recurrent setting of what you've mentioned um same the hormones i really like um bevacizumab as well i think that has good activity there's the trametinib, so there's the MEK inhibitors, mm -hmm. um, and then there's these newer targeted agents as well. And it's also possible, I would definitely be checking for folate receptor as well, um, because I think that that also, um, like something like the uh, Mervitux might also be an option for, for that as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. And then clinical trials are um, always really, really important. Mm-hmm. 
Great, thank you. Um, and so I'm seeing some questions about N her two. Um, and so what about and her two for ovarian cancer? So that's another type of um, uh, antibody uh, drug conjugate. And so that's the target. So for um, uh, Mervitox, the target was folate receptor for and her two. Um, and the deroxetin, uh, or deroxetin is what we call it. For that one, um, it's her two, H-E-R-2. Is, is the target. So in the breast cancer world, they developed this drug. It was a phenomenally successful drug. And even in patients who just had low expression of that, they had really cool results and saw great responses. So they're now looking at it in other cancers that potentially express HER2. And so there has been in clinical trials have shown activity in, um, in ovarian cancer um, that expresses it. So those are kind of exciting um, newer treatment options that we didn't have um, available before. And that's not everybody's eligible for it. And I would definitely encourage people to talk to their physicians about it because they're still trying to figure out how best to give it. Um, for example, that drug can definitely cause um, a pneumonitis, that inflammation of the lungs that I was talking about. So it's just important to uh, discuss that. And I don't think that it's got added to the guidelines yet um, for ovarian cancer. So also usually we don't add things to the guidelines until we're sure that the risks and the benefits outweigh each other and that it makes sense. So the way to access that drug would be through, a, 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 our similar type drug would be through a clinical trial at the moment. Um, and we're often trying to figure out and we know what works in breast cancer, but in ovarian cancer, like. What's the optimal expression of HER2 or, you know, who should, who would be the most likely to derive benefit? And so we're still trying to figure that out. Great. Thank you. Um, and so this person is asking about um, the effectiveness of oral targeted chemotherapy versus IV chemotherapy for recurrent ovarian. I, I get asked that question a lot and it's a really great question. And I totally understand why putting something in your mouth, you'd assume that it should have way less side effects than um, getting it into the vein. That's not always the case. So sometimes some of the oral drugs have way more side effects than IV. It's definitely way more convenient to be able to take an oral drug. But usually the reason that we're able to give an IV or um, an oral uh, by mouth formulation is just because of the properties of the individual medication. So Usually with oral drugs, you have to take them quite frequently, like daily, because they don't stay around in your system that long. Whereas the IVs, you know, often we're giving them once every three weeks or once every four weeks or sometimes as frequently as once a week. And that's just to do with their ability to stay around. So usually the reason we're giving something IV is maybe we can't figure out a way to safely give it by mouth and, or, and that it would stay around long enough. Um, so just because something is an oral drug does not mean it's not going to have side effects, though. Um, uh, like the, the PARP inhibitors are very well tolerated, but they have some side effects. I think I saw one of the questions in the chat was saying somebody had bloating. It's so common to have that as a side effect of the um, ad nausea and fatigue as part of a PARP inhibitor. But anytime people are having, um, sim you know, any kind of uh, uh, symptoms or anything like that, I would uh, always discuss it with your, your doctor. And, and sometimes there's even just something as simple as an anti-nausea medicine can help with that. And is there any difference in terms of effectiveness? There can be, yeah. Sometimes there, I, I wouldn't, when I'm thinking about a drug, I'm trying to think, oh, I wonder what's the best for this individual patient. And then ideally, if it's equal, I'd happily give it an oral medication that's just so much better. But usually the IV drugs are, are more effective. However, in the future, I bet you we'll figure out ways to formulate them into a pill form, like they've done for the PARP inhibitors, and people can take them. If I knew, for example, one of my patients was going away for a little while, I might try really try and see if there's an oral drug chemo option that they could take. But often the oral chemo drugs, although they're much more convenient and they may not be as effective. There's sometimes a very good treatment option though, especially if somebody doesn't say have a lot of cancer or um, as I said, they maybe can't come to the chemo unit as often or something like that, but you still need to get your labs checked and things like that. Great, thank you. Um, and so this person is asking how successful the drug ever, ever, 
yes, um, has been with recurrent ovarian cancer with a, a PIK3CA mutation. Um, I think, okay, it, you know, there is some benefit. Usually we feel that you have to give it in combination with something else like letrozole, which is that aromatase inhibitor I was mentioning. And I'm not sure if they were asking in the context of usually it's um, like an endometrioid tumor. So it's usually those kind of subtypes um, that is listed as one of the treatment options. I don't particularly love Evrolimus. I think it has a, a good few side effects. Um, and so that is an oral treatment option. Um, and both of them actually are. But um, I think that that's, uh, that can be just a little bit difficult to, to tolerate. And um, I would probably sooner put somebody on a clinical trial, if I could, of um, one of the newer um, PIK3 targeting agents, if, if I could. Mm -hmm. But but it's definitely an option and it's definitely worth um, trying if, if it's, you know, the the uh, treating doctor thinks that it's it, it makes sense for that individual patient. Great, thank you. And I'm seeing um, some questions about Olaparib and just sort of how long you would keep a patient on it. Um, like Great questions. With, so in more the, than two years or? I feel a little bit uh, less is more nowadays because of the risk of being on it. I, I have seen patients um, develop leukemias and myelodysplastic syndrome. So, and the data is for two years um, for Olaparib. So I definitely stick to the two years. If I had to stop sooner, that would be okay. And some people are even considering it, looking at would shorter courses be okay? Because in breast cancer, they chose to do a year um, of uh, PARP inhibition. And then there's another drug called Neraparib and that one is three years. So I think we're still trying to figure out what the optimal duration is. In the upfront setting, I wouldn't give it longer than that. And in the recurrent setting, given the data that suggests there is these higher risk of developing blood cancers later, I have started um, shortening the amount of time. And, and I really would try not to give more than two years in the recurrent setting either. It, again, it's a case by case basis. And it would also, um, you know, it's also a, a, a discussion with the individual patient. Mm -hmm. Um, and this person is asking whether the chance of recurrence declines as their period of being NED. Yes. Um, the good off. news is the way I feel is there's a two year mark. So once you get to that initial two mark, that's really great. So the cancer hasn't come back within two years. And then the next big uh, milestone is the five year mark. After you hit the five year mark and the cancer has not returned, there's a huge fall off of, as in the risk just dramatically uh, goes down at that that point. Fortunately, I can't say that somebody couldn't recur longer than the five years, but once somebody has reached that five-year mark, I, I think it's a really much, much, much less likely that they will recur. And, and in general, even if it does recur at that stage, it tends to be obviously a, a lot more treatable because so long has passed since their last um, treatments. Um, very rarely, I think sometimes people develop a new cancer. I've had patients maybe develop a new primary 17 years later or something like that. So people who be a little bit higher risk of that is if they have a BRCA mutation. Um, that said, often patients with a BRCA mutation are exquisitely sensitive to the treatment and also do really phenomenally well with the PARP inhibitor too. So there's always pros and cons for everything. Mm -hmm. uh, and so this person is asking um, what... What do you use as a guideline for being concerned about uh, someone's CA125 le level um, and like when it doubles or when it mo moves a few spaces? Well, if any of my patients are on, they'll um, they'll definitely say that I always say we treat the patient and not the CA125. So to me, the CA125 is a piece of the puzzle. There is never a CA125 that will prompt me to to treat, that's not, I don't treat off a CA125. I do not ignore it either, I absolutely use it, but I more use it to guide me in terms of imaging and, and things like that. Um, in the very rare scenario, say where somebody has persistently elevated CA125s and I've done all the imaging and I really can't find any cancers, sometimes I do just do a quick scan of the head as well, because sometimes something could pop up there that explains why the CA125 is, is um, very abnormal. In the setting of a normal CA125, 
you know, anything for any reason, it can fluctuate within that normal range. So I, I wouldn't be too alarmed. But, you know, again, in discussion with the patients, we may or may not choose to scan a little bit earlier, depending on what's going on. But um, I, yeah, I don't in general make treatment decisions based on CE125 alone. Mm -hmm. I hope that answers the question. I'm sure we'll get more questions if it did it. <laughs> um, okay, so this person is asking um, for those on letrozole for low grade serious, um, what are we seeing for outcomes? You know, what is its has its effectiveness been? Yeah, I mean that clinical trial is going to uh, address the question of whether or not we should start with the letrozole, but in the recurrent setting, I, I've had some patients who've had really durable responses. That means that their cancer has been really well controlled and those drugs tend to be quite well tolerated. They can thin the bone. So there's a higher risk of osteoporosis or osteopenia. But so I, I just check the bone health, um, you know, every few years, do a DEXA scan. Um, I think they're really well tolerated. And for some patients, they can derive really, really substantial prolonged benefit. But it does depend how sensitive the, um, the can that individual's cancer is to hormone blockade. And we don't do letrozole um, on its own if somebody has their ovaries in because um, that's it's really for somebody has to be, their body has to be in the menopausal setting. And um, so there are drugs that they can do to induce that, but um, otherwise um, often the ovary is out. Mm -hmm. um, and so this question is asking whether after the first line um, therapy and surgery, if there is a recurrence, is it a good idea to do the same chemo? Um, and how long, so if somebody, how, if they just finished their treatment or are we saying that a bit of time has passed? It doesn't indicate, so well, maybe you could. I can answer both. Yeah. Uh, so if um, at least a year has passed, I, I would, well, I always talk to my, sur I, so I'm not a surgeon, I, I prescribe chemo. So, but usually, my, so my patients usually have two doctors. They have me, and they have the surgeon. So I normally run this the recurrence by the surgeon. Um, if it's just one spot and more than a year has passed, I would definitely see if we could try and remove that. I don't tend to do the exact same chemo. I tend to do the carboplatin again, and then I'd add in another drug. And um, so maybe a drug called like liposomal doxorubicin or gemcitabine, or and I might even give bevacizumab. Um, but I would definitely talk to my surgical colleagues to see if surgery is an option first, and then we would do some kind of platinum-based chemo. If a very long time has passed and it was more than just one side of disease, I still, like say we're talking about years, then I still might think surgery makes a lot of sense because it's been a long time and, and it would still be chemo afterwards. Then they just pretend it only was in three months ago and they just finished their treatment and now there's a recurrence and it's only one site, but they just had... Uh, their surgery and just finish their chemo. I don't think I would be recommending surgery in that situation. And because it's a recurrence within six months of getting the their last carboplatin or their platinum, I probably also wouldn't be recommending carboplatin either. I, I might just go for something very different, a drug that they have never seen before. And maybe I might give it in combination with bevacizumab. Great, thank you. Uh, and so I'm seeing some questions about immunotherapy and we also had one submitted um, through the registration form. So I'm wondering if you could talk about whether any progress has been made with immunotherapy and recurrent ovarian cancer. Yeah, there is a really good reason why we think immunotherapy should work in ovarian cancer, because we know that when we see immune cells within an ovarian cancer, we know that's a good thing. And um, it shows that the immune system is being activated and actually it can that can pretend to something really good. That said, it has been so hard for us to figure out how to make immunotherapy work for ovarian cancer, because often our patients are really, really healthy. So it's not like they didn't have a healthy immune system to start with. It's something about the characteristics maybe of the ovarian cancer. We sometimes think about it almost like Harry Potter cloak. So the ovarian cancer just uh, covers like the, the invisible cloak and makes it invisible to the immune system. So we are still working on a way of figuring out how to remove that invisible cloak and make the um, the cancer visible to the immune cells so they can attack it and, and get rid of it. Um, so usually we need a combination approach. You could think of chemotherapy and PARP inhibitors even as a type of immunotherapy because if they cause cell death, then the guys who come and mop that up are, are the immune cells. So 
Um, a, a lot of the treatments we do um, in a in a strain system are, are like almost like a form of immunotherapy, although they're they're technically not caused that. There are a substantial portion of patients who probably with just giving us a, a single agent immunotherapy just wouldn't get any benefit and, and would get some risks. But then there's a small proportion that probably do. And we're still trying to figure out how to identify those patients or, or their cancers that would benefit from immunotherapy. So there are certain very rare things where there's a really high mutational burden that's on a report and it'll say TMB high. And usually that is greater than 10. In ovarian cancer, it's usually one or less than four. It's, it's just so uncommon. So I, I have very few patients where that TMB is high. The other other thing that somebody might see in a report is MSI high. Um, normally it's MS stable. Um, and so MSI high, again, very rare, maybe more common with the endometrioids and the clear cells. And um, that would be another indication for immunotherapy. Those are the approved indications. And then of course, we have a lot of clinical trials. But I think in general, it'd have to be a clinical trial looking at a few different kind of immune combination approaches. I, I wish we'd been more effective. Another thing we tried a lot is vaccines. It's still not something I'm willing to abandon, but we just still have to figure out how to make those kind of treatments work well. And we are working on that. Great, thank you. And so this uh, here's a, a question asking for some clarification. When you refer to a two-year mark uh, for NED, is that counted as the last round of chemo, date of diagnosis, last PARP inhibitor? What sort of what is I definitely count the five-year mark from the um from their diagnosis, the mm -hmm. initial diagnosis. For the two-year, honestly, it's with the patient. It depends. Like if they are still on a PARP inhibitor, I probably start the clock a little bit later, you know, maybe when we finish the chemo. Um, so it, I individualize a little bit. It's some people who don't get any kind of, um, so usually for that two year mark, I, I usually am thinking about the end of the chemo, but if they got something like a PARP inhibitor, then usually they and I are talking about maybe extending it a little bit longer because they were on some treatment. So we were, you know, often we're saying maybe at least a year after they finished their PARP inhibitor. Um, mm -hmm. But the hope is, you know, that patients who are appropriate for PARP inhibitors and who get it will do really well as well. So it's not that we're not trying to share the information. It's just trying to figure out how the cancer will behave off treatment. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for that. Um, so this person is asking if you have to take a break from Bev for maintenance to get another surgery, mm -hmm. is it less risky for recurrence to take the break longer into maintenance versus earlier in the maintenance? That's a good question. I mean, sometimes if I have to do something, I might just do it before I even start the BEV because it can definitely impair wound healing. Um, so it's a little bit, um, it's a little bit, uh, it, it really depends what the procedure is. It's a little bit tricky to answer. If somebody's symptomatic from their cancer, I would definitely try and prioritize the treatment. So maybe later if possible, but again, it would depend how urgent the procedure was. And if it was very urgent, like just pretend it was something to do with the heart or something like that, then I think it would be definitely prioritizing that. And then it'd be so important to tell whoever the surgeon is, or just pretend it's even just something as simple as getting a tooth out that they know, because for example, in getting teeth pulled, there's a risk that the, jaw, the gum won't heal over properly. Mm -hmm. So, and with any kind of surgery, there's also a risk that, um, that there won't be as good he healing. There's a, high, a higher risk of blood clots with the Avastin. So it's just important to just make sure that that physician is aware as well that you've got that drug recently. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so this, another clarification question, um, where the, basically they're asking, where does ovarian cancer uh, first show up in a recurrence in the blood or in the body so like like on a scan yeah I'm trying to think you know often it's a little bit of all I mean I think the follow-up is so important that's so usually my follow-up is it, just assuming somebody isn't on a PARP inhibitor because you obviously have to follow up more often for blood work and stuff like that if you are but it's normally the um, every three months for the first two years every four to six months for year three and then every six months for years four and five I tend to alternate those visits with the surgeons um, so between taking a history, um, asking the patient, you know, about any new symptoms, examining them, um, checking if their CO125 was high, because just pretend the CO125 was never high at a diagnosis. 
at the initial diagnosis, I wouldn't consider that as reliable then. Um, but I still check it. Um, but I then might be a, bit, a little bit more reliant on scans. And then I discuss with my patients how frequently we will do scans. I individualize it. Um, and so say somebody has pristine scans two in a row, then I might consider foregoing the next one. Um, but you know, but then with a plan that I would add in that scan if if they were unwell, you know, at the next visit or there was any symptoms. Uh, if there's something that's I maybe a little bit unusual, or there was maybe a new lymph node or something, I, I might want to do an earlier scan to to follow up. Um, so I think that there's no, it depends how rapid how quick how frequently you're monitoring somebody at but I think if you're monitoring somebody I think um I think it's at those visits to be honest that we would pick pick it up mm -hmm. great and so uh, we're getting some questions about um options for high-grade serous recurrence in the lymph nodes after platinum and dap and doxel and is the question what to do is it yes it, it oh. looks like that <laughs> what um, and they have so they if there's platinum and doxal chances are it's this this is the second recurrence and um, so again it depends how long ago if it was a long long time ago i would talk to my surgery colleagues if it wasn't a long time ago um and it's in several spots which it sounds like it is then usually we would do some kind of systemic treatment option and so what we could do is we could definitely check for the folate receptor, like we talked uh, about looking to see if mervituximab is an option. And um, then there would be standard chemotherapy options. I probably would give the standard chemo option in combination with bevacizumab unless there was a reason not to. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, all right. This question is about... Uh, is high pack used for high for care for, for cancer for... well i guess uh, specifically for recurrence like is it we, is it applicable for yeah recurrence? we did a study and um it was in the first recurrence of platinum sensitive so that was the first time somebody's cancer came back and it came back within more than over a six months from their prior platinum based therapy and unfortunately it was a negative study we didn't show that high pack was helpful um, I do like the idea of it. The idea is that we give heated chemo into the belly. Um, that said, you know, the data is the data. We did the study and it didn't show that it was beneficial. So um, at our institute, we either do a clinical trial in the recurrent setting or um, in the upfront setting, we're giving it for those patients um, as a part of a clinical trial for their first surgery or at the um, if they need new adjuvant treatment and they have stage three disease and they responded, then we're offering it to patient at the interval debulking. But it can cause side effects as well. It is still chemo and it can theoretically maybe um, impair wound healing. But more importantly, I think it's sometimes the drugs can damage the kidneys a little bit. So we just have to be a little bit careful. And it definitely extends the duration of the surgery too. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. And I am seeing some questions about scans, and I just want to put out a plug that we do have a uh, webinar from May that's on our website that's entirely about scans and when and why they're used. So um, definitely check that out. Um, okay, so this person is asking about um, whether older age is associated with recurrence. Um, yes, it is actually. Um, so being older is um, does have a higher risk. That said, we know that patients who are older derive the same benefit from treatment. So just because somebody is older is not a reason not to treat their cancer aggressively. And so we try and figure out measures and remember that we're not just looking at chronic age or chronological age. We have to think of other indices that maybe figure out a bit more if somebody's likely to have a lot of side effects from treatment. And so that's called indices of frailty. So we, we try and incorporate um, those kind of measures. And we often involve our co colleagues from medicine for the elderly because they can be really good and give me really accurate predictions of what the risk would be if I do X or what it would be if I do Y. So sometimes they might tell me, oh, it's a really bad idea to give two drugs in this individual patient because of there is such high risk because of all these other reasons. And as we all get older, I suppose our um, we tend to have other 
comorbidity. So like blood pressure, or we might have had a recent stroke or heart attack, things like that. So um, but then a lot of our patients are very, very fit as well, even as they age. So it, it's really individualizing it. We also take into account the age when we're dosing some of our drugs, because that also takes into account how well the kidneys are working. Um, so uh, it, it, it really depends. Age is just a number sometimes, but it, it, we do take it into, into account. Mm -hmm. um, and is there an understanding of why some ovarian cancers come back and others don't? Yeah. And I, I, one thing I will say, it's never the patient's fault. You know, these are things that just happen. It's, it's bad luck. And in some people where it doesn't come back, it's really good luck as well. Um, uh, so, uh, the, you know, ovarian cancer is not one that's caused by people doing something that caused it, uh, as in many cancers are, but I, I'm just would like to reassure people that it's not their fault that they developed it. And it's definitely not their fault if they have a recurrence. Sometimes the immune system can work particularly well in eradicating the cancer and keeping it under control. Um, and sometimes a mistake in the gene called a mutation um, can just be a bad one that happens or it can be a particularly um, aggressive type. And then those mutations, it's almost like the cancer is missing its spell check. So it, more mistakes are able to be happen. Um, and so that, that's why it comes back. In general, when cancer comes back, it tends to be a chronic disease so that in general, it's extremely hard to eradicate, get rid of um, recurrent ovarian cancer. And I always wish, I, I hope I convey to our patients, like we'd love to cure everybody, you know, even in the recurrent setting. So it's not that we don't want to cure the cancer. The problem is that we know from experience that it tends to stay around. And so our kind of our focus changes then into trying to control the cancer for as long as possible and keep the person as well as possible while controlling the cancer. And I have some patients who have multiple recurrences and tend to very, very minimal symptoms because we knew the cancer was there, but we just about managed to, to keep on top of it. And then other people can have a lot of symptoms. And so it's just trying to, to figure that out. Everybody's an individual and, and their cancers are individuals too and, and can behave that way. Thank you for that. Um, this person is wondering what the effectiveness is of doxel and carboplatin with Avastin um, with the first for the first recovery. Yeah, I, I like that as a treatment option. I think there's uh, hopefully a good chance of, that would suggest that treatment option that somebody has platinum sensitive recurrence. So I, I do think that's a good treatment option. And usually what we do is we give six cycles of chemo and then we continue the bevacizumab as maintenance afterwards. So I would hope that somebody would do well with that. Mm -hmm. Okay, great, thank you. And then we're getting a question sort of on the timing of maintenance therapy. So if you are a little late to start it after first line treatment, does that have any impact on effectiveness? Um, it depends. It, it depends uh, why the decision is now to do it. So, for example, say we missed that somebody had a BRCA mutation. Um, I probably wouldn't would try if it was in that context. I'm thinking about a PARP inhibitor. I ideally would like to do the PARP inhibitor within 12 weeks. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason is we think that the chemotherapy bed is probably important, that it's the two things together. So recent chemo does seem to be important. Our recent platinum-based chemo and response to that does seem to be important for the action for um, a PARP inhibitor. If it was for financial reasons, then, you know, there are a lot of patient support groups. Um, and I would encourage you to talk to your doctors. And there's all kinds of support mechanisms to try and help patients pay for their medications or financial assistance programs. And um, if it was because you were really sick, it would depend on why, you know, it, I think it would have to depend on why there was such a delay, but some people don't need maintenance. And the problem is we can't figure out cleverly enough who are the patients who are never going to recur because some patients were cured before we had any maintenance options. Um, and that you would just gave in those days carbotaxol. Um, the problem is that we just are not sure uh, how best to identify those patients. So um, my quick answer is probably not everybody will need maintenance. So I, I would talk to your doctor and, and see for you as an individual, do they think that it makes sense starting it at a later stage or not? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, this person is asking if radiation is successful for lymph node only recurrence. I don't tend to give a lot of radiation for high-grade serous ovarian cancer. I do on a case-by-case -case basis, but 
um, I probably wouldn't be my go-to thing because it, it can cause uh, risk of bowel obstruction and things like that. There are certain people though that for whatever reason, you, they just may not be a candidate for chemotherapy or they might have a lymph node in an unusual spot such as in their neck or in their groin or something. And it might make sense to do some radiation then, but I, I don't tend to do a lot of radiation um, for high-grade serous. Mm -hmm. Uh, we're getting some questions about the benefit for, um, being on a PARP inhibitor, like a laparib for 18 months versus two years. And well, whether... I, they're almost the same thing. So, uh, I don't think that that would, I, I, you know, it would depend. Usually we try and aim for the two years. That's the current guide, guidance of where we are. It may be shorter in the future. But, you know, if somebody's having um, a lot of side effects or something like that, then the 18 months might make sense for them. Mm -hmm. um, okay, I'm just looking through. All right, so this person is asking about when you have a recurrent patient, how long will you keep in a port? The PARP inhibitor, is it? A port, like the oh, a port. Oh, I'm so sorry. Oh, I love the metaports. <laughs> They're so um good to help save the veins. In the recurrent setting, I tend to keep them in for life. You know, because often we'll be monitoring someone even if they're not getting treatment. In the upfront setting, I tend to remove them if the patient wants at the two year mark. So two years after they're done with their chemo. If they did a PARP, it'd probably be two years after they did a PARP inhibitor. Um. But I, I would definitely keep them in until that two-year mark, unless, and of course, if they, in the rare, very rare occasion that they might get infected or something like that, then of course it can come out earlier. Mm -hmm. um, and I know we've touched on some of the rare tumor types, but this person is asking about any studies on recurrent endometri endometrioid adenocarcinoma. Um, a lot of the um, studies would allow endometrioid, so they're normally not excluded, especially high grade. For low grade, we almost think like they're almost like more like a, a uterine, can you know, they usually arise in endometriosis, so they happen to be present on the ovary, but they, they're very similar, look very similar to endometrioid, endometrial cancer. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah. And oh. so they would normally be permitted into any of the studies. Mm -hmm. And... So this person is specifically, you know, because of your background in cell therapy, this person is interested in hearing your views on that approach. Um, so cell therapy, I'm really excited about it, but we still haven't figured out how to make it work and how to do it safely for ovarian cancer. So there are cell therapy trials, but they tend to be kind of high risk trials. And um, the hope is in the future, this type of treatment, which has been amazingly successful in leukemia, and um, now there's some really exciting data in melanoma um, so and cervical cancer, but we still have to figure out how to do it safely for ovarian cancer. So it's, it's really not there yet, but we are still um, exploring it in clinical trials. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Um, what was I looking? Um, so this person is asking... Um, whether there's anything patients can do to try to prevent a recurrence? No, I mean, as I, I mentioned, there's nothing that the individual, um, but like like all of us, it's always good to eat healthily and it's always good for us all to exercise, but we have to use our common sense as well. And I wish there was a magic diet that if you just take it, you wouldn't recur. And there's very, they, they did huge studies in breast cancer and they said, they showed that a junk food diet or a non-healthy diet is not good. But a healthy, balanced diet was just as good as a really super organic, super restricted diet. So I think as long as you try your best to maintain a he healthy lifestyle. Um, but do I think that somebody's cancer came back because they had some ch a chocolate or they had some cake? No, I definitely don't think that's the case. Um, but it's always good to have a healthy body and you feel better as well when you do all these right things. So um, I think that's my, my main reason. But I, I would, yeah, and often your doctor would have access to a nutritionist and they could help. And some of the diets, I wish that they worked, but they just don't. So 
you know, it's always important to seek medical advice because they can cause some harm as well. Some of the diets, they can be maybe lacking in certain nutrients and you might feel particularly unwell following them as well. The only other thing I, I just wanted to make sure that I mention is anyone with a family history or an individual history of ovarian cancer, genetic testing is so important. And um, there's an opportunity to give a, a gift to the next generation. And so that's by doing genetic testing and knowing we can look for mutations such as the BRCA mutations. And there are steps that your family members can take to reduce their risk of developing ovarian cancer in the future. So if at all possible, I, I really, um, it's something so important to talk to your families about um, and to know whether or not you yourself have a BRCA mutation as well, because it's also very helpful in guiding your treatment. Such an important reminder. This person is asking um, what EGFR do you have to have to be enrolled in a clinical trial? Um, it's not, re EGFR isn't as much a marker for um, ovarian cancer as it is. So there is none that it wouldn't have to be uh, anything either way for EGF or in the current landscape of over ovarian cancer. Mm -hmm. And it's more cold. We use it in colon cancer and lung. They're the main ones. Mm -hmm. And we've gotten some questions about sort of overall uh, sort of statistics for recurrence. And this person is asking, you know, how long in general are people living after a recurrence? I mean, it's usually years is what I would say. Um, and the hope, that's the the hope. But then, you know, sometimes people, like I have some patients who live decades with their cancer, but in general, in the recurrence setting, it's living with the cancer and it becomes kind of a new normal. And some patients, you know, despite their best efforts, they did everything right. And we gave what we felt was the best treatment you know, sometimes the cancer just doesn't respond to that. So unfortunately, sometimes people can have complications and they'll live a lot shorter than we would like, which is absolutely not fair. And we really are trying to improve the treatment options for patients. Um, but the reality is, I suppose we give statistics, but each person is an individual and where they fall within those statistics can be difficult to predict. The statistics tell us what happens for a group of like 100 women, but it won't necessarily tell us what will happen for that one individual patient. And that can be hard, you know, because, you know, people, it's a lot, it's important, it's planning. I, I would encourage people, though, to talk to their doctors, because sometimes we as doctors don't want to upset our patients. So, but if you have, like, concrete questions, you know, do, um, you know, your doctor more than happy to talk to you about them. They don't want to upset you. I, I do try and have those conversations with my patients quite frequently, but um, it, it, they are important. And they might be able to figure out a little bit better where you are you know, in terms of where they feel your cancer is or what stage of your the cancer journey are you in? Because there are different stages. There's the initial diagnosis and the hope is that that stage that somebody be cured. The vast majority, unfortunately, do develop recurrent disease, but it's very treatable. And then sometimes we end up in a situation where although we have treatment options, it may be that the person is so unwell that it just doesn't make sense to do that. And we actually could be paradoxically shorting someone's life, making it shorter by giving treatment, which is exact opposite of what we want to do. So it's always important to kind of know where um, the individual is along that cancer journey. And then we can, as oncologists, we try our very best to support you through all those different aspects of the cancer journey. Great, thank you. And we're almost at time. And so to end it, I would just ask um, Dr. O'Carroll, is, is there anything you're particularly excited about that's you know being studied or any like key takeaway you have or anything you think that we haven't covered that um, patients should be aware of um I think there's a lot of really I, I like the antibody drug conjugates I think they're very exciting there's the bispecific antibodies I also think they're very exciting I'm not sure that they're the the cure, but that what they may just be is an, an yet another option. And so it's lovely as we keep adding all these extra treatment options that our, our patients are able to avail of them. And so I think it is exciting. I, I love, for example, that we've had some new approvals like the Mervituximab, and I, I just love being able to offer that to my patients. We have some clinical trials at the moment, and I'm hoping maybe in a year or two that those might become new, what's considered standard treatment options, even though they're at the clinical trial um, setting at the moment. Great. Thank you so much. And thank you, Dr. O'Carroll, for you know your thoughtful answers. 
thoughtful and thorough answers to all of these questions. And I think we got through a lot um, and we really appreciate you taking the time to answer all of these questions. Um, we'll have uh, the recording of this program available in, on our website in one to two weeks. Um, and so also please make sure to check out Cher's website for upcoming educational programs and support groups. And don't forget to follow us on social media as well. We also ask that you please take a moment to fill out the survey at the end of the webinar. The survey will pop up in the browser when the webinar ends and the link will also be sent in the follow-up email. All surveys are anonymous. Uh, this concludes the webinar. Thank you again, Dr. O'Carroll, and thank You're you welcome. to all of you who participated and asked questions. Yeah, today. thanks for the amazing, they're really great questions. Thank you so much. Okay, take care. Bye. You too.